I, uh, I don't have the little uh, bell that we ring. I, I didn't bring one, and I assume that may be uh, Bill's personal property, so uh, it won't seem the same uh, beginning without that today. We'll just pretend and uh, take a moment to center yourselves, as Bill might say, something like that. So uh, just take a few seconds, and then uh, we'll start. So let's begin that uh, centering process now. Okay, um, well, I'm, I'm very glad you're here today, and I'm glad to be here also. Uh, I, uh, uh, most of you would know, some may not, I was a, a senior pastor, I want to say across the way, it's, it's all one church, I was pastor of this part of the church too, but uh, I retired nine years ago, so I've been away uh, from active duty, as we might say, but uh, still pretty much, pretty much engaged here at St. Paul's. I uh, have taught a lot of Sunday school classes uh, during those nine years. I took about the first year off completely just to be away uh, for those that followed me and, and for my sake too, everyone else's sake as well. But uh, for the last eight years or so, I have taught a lot of Sunday school classes. And so I'm not always in this class, but generally when I am not teaching somewhere else, uh, I do attend this class. And uh, I, uh, for the summer, I've been attending here because I have not been teaching in uh, other classes. I usually do in the fall and spring. But it's very good to be with you today. Uh, Bill, of course, is unique. There's only... Uh, one Bill Curley. I don't do magic tricks. <laughs> I, I, I did learn that many of the cartoons and what have you that appear on the screen, at least before the class starts, apparently don't come from Bill. They, they were already there and he's not even here and I didn't supply them. So Tim or Will or somebody uh, put those on the screen for you this morning as uh, you were arriving. I wanted to say just a word too about uh, the class here. Uh, I, I think most of you realize, I certainly do as, as a pastor, what a unique experience this is in the class of ordinary life. Uh, you wouldn't find something like this uh, a half a dozen times across the United States, at least in United Methodist churches. Uh, it is a, a rare experience to have uh, thoughtful, engaging, push the edge kind of Christian thinking in a Sunday school class where you hear some of the things that Bill talks about uh, on Sunday morning and that you, you allow him to say those things and, and actually kind of uh, participate with him in the dialogue that happens in that process and all the things that happen through the week and all the people that are engaged uh, on the live stream right now. So it, it's just a remarkable experience to have this as, as a part of the church. And it just doesn't happen very many places. So I appreciate your willingness to allow this to happen and certainly Bill for uh, teaching every Sunday. It is a unique experience. So uh, knowing all of those things, uh, it, it Bill's hard to follow. You know, it's hard to stand up here. Dr. Powers uh, has an opportunity to do that the next couple of weeks. But uh, it's, it's, uh, he's a hard person to follow. So I, I thought about, you know, what do I know enough about to talk to a group like this uh, for 45 minutes or so. And I could talk about the United Methodist Church, but you know, uh, you probably are familiar with where we are and that story right now, and we're moving toward a schism, and uh, I'll do that another time. A little bit of what I'll say today will relate to that to some degree, so I chose not to do that. The other thing I know a little bit about is the liturgical tradition of the church. I know about seasons and times and colors and all of those things that make up the things that we do as a part of worship and to order our life 
on a daily basis. If you want to know what my uh, spiritual practice is, I guess that would be it. I know Bill talks about, couldn't get through a lesson without talking about spiritual practices, could we? Uh, I think mine is participating in the liturgical uh, process of the church. And I could have talked about that today, but you might not be too interested in that. <laughs> Apparently not. So. <laughs> Uh, so what the other thing that I know a little bit about, at least, maybe I, I start to say maybe I know more than you do, and that's all that matters, but, <laughs> but maybe I don't. <laughs> but I, I know a little bit about the Bible. I know a little bit about the, the, uh, the background of the Bible, how it came to be, uh, what a complicated it, book it is. And I know some of you know uh, part of that story as well. So that's the direction I wanted to go today, and I think it will uh, complement what Bill has been doing with uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, he does actually get to John most Sundays in a, in a, in a, in a very broad way. Uh, and you know, John is one of those books that gives you permission to kind of wander into lots of different kinds of analogies and uh, the, the kinds of things that are part of mysticism and the things that uh, Bill just loves. So it's, it's not surprising that he would choose that book. The metaphorical uh, opportunities in the Gospel of John are plenty. So um, hopefully what we'll talk about a little bit today uh, will be uh, related to that as well. So um, Here's my outline. I usually don't do PowerPoint. My wife helped me greatly with this. You'll see some of her uh, uh, adding. I just did the text and she added pictures and things and she thought it appropriate at one point to add fire. So uh, we'll <laughs> see when that one <laughs> pops up. It was, it was a scripture passage from the Bible that she thought was kind of fiery. So uh, she's got that one going for us today. So this is my outline uh, that we'll go with. And I noticed after we put it on the screen that uh, though what I sent, I think what was sent out through the week had the title of this, uh, what appears on your screen does not have the title in it. So let me just share that title with you. It is uh, Dialogic Countercurrents in the Canon of the Old Testament. So... Uh, Okay, I've succeeded. I, I sound like I know something. <laughs> um, the, the word canon, C-A-N-O-N, uh, means uh, those book in the Bible, it references those books that measure up. Canon was a unit of measure uh, in ancient times. And so when they began that process of uh, putting together the books that were acceptable, uh, understood to be authoritative and inspirational and appropriate for uh, use either in uh, Jewish worship or eventually Christian worship. They referred to it as the books that are part of the canon, those that measure up. There were others they could have chosen, but we, we have, at least in the Protestant tradition, uh, 39 Old Testament books, as we call it, and 27 New Testament books as a part of the canon. So I wanted to look at uh, the Old Testament today uh, and, and look at uh, what could be called uh, the dominant theology of the Old Testament, and then look at some of the countercurrents that uh, are in dialogue, if you will. So, dialogic uh, countercurrents in the uh, canon of the Old Testament. So, what's the primary uh, message or theology, if you will? of the Old Testament canon, and then where are those aspects within that canon itself that run counter to the primary narrative? So I thought it might be interesting for us to look at that today, especially in the light of uh, some of the things that are uh, kind of passing for uh, uh, Christian or Jewish orthodoxy these days, uh, to know that within the Bible itself, they're countercurrents where some of you may find yourself more in that uh, countercurrent than you do in the, the main uh, narrative that is presented. Uh, years ago, uh, we went to Colorado and took a, a float trip down one of the rivers there. And it was, you know, a little bit rough and some of the uh, waves and what have you, the rapids were 
pretty difficult. And so every now and then our guide, we had someone guiding the boat to some extent, would say uh, it's time to eddy out. <laughs> now if you know what an eddy is in a river, it's that part of the river that doesn't flow forward, but it's over to the edge and it kind of stops. It kind of forms a little whirlpool or something and backs up for a while uh, to let you kind of catch your breath and find another perspective. So we're going to eddy out a little bit today when we, when we look at, at the Bible. So uh, those are the, uh, that's the outline that I will follow. And uh, uh, here, here is my working definition of, uh, of the Bible. If I were to ask you to complete the sentence, the Bible is, we would have many different ways that you would complete that sentence. Uh, here's the way I complete that sentence. And I wrote this, uh, just uh, not a lot of help from other peoples. I didn't, uh, I don't think I've plagiarized anybody's definition. Um, when I taught a class on the Old Testament uh, back last year in the Journey Sunday School class, and I haven't decided to modify it yet. So this is what I'm going with for now. The Bible is the written account of the Judeo-Christian faith community's 2,000-year experience with God and with people inside and outside the faith community. So we have a 2,000-year period that make up the biblical narrative from Abraham. Those first 11 chapters in Genesis are, are really kind of theological story and prehistory of creation and fall and uh, Adam and Eve stories and uh, Cain and Abel and the flood and the Tower of Babel. When you get to the 12th chapter of Genesis, you get to uh, a historic figure, Abraham. And Abraham is a part of the Hebrew people, uh, probably better known in times past as Hibiru. And the best way to think about uh, Abraham and his tribe of people is to think about a migratory people, much like we still have today. So Abraham's peoples migrated from what would be now uh, Iraq into what is now Turkey down through what is now Syria, and finally uh, into what is now uh, Israel, Holy Land, Palestine, uh, Canaan, had lots of different names, still refer to some of those names today. So it's, it's, it's better if you think about uh, that beginning story of uh, the Hebrew people as a migratory tribe of people looking for a better life, the same way people migrate today, looking for jobs, a better life for their children, something to eat, uh, greener pastures, if you will. And so that's the story of Abraham's people as well. Abraham makes that migration, ends up in what is now uh, Israel, and the gift of the Hebiru, the Hebrew people, to the world is monotheism. That is to say, uh, a belief and understanding that there is one God, that uh, one entity, one spirit, one mystery, whatever name you want to give to it, that they're not multiplicities of gods that control rain and thunder and uh, evil and uh, acts of uh, violence and uh, the earth and the, pros uh, and the crops and rotations and things like that. But there's, there's one God, and that's kind of the gift of uh, Abraham and the Hebiru people uh, to the world. And so we have three major religions that have kind of looked back to Abraham as the gift of monotheism and it's developed in different ways. Of course, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam all look back to Abraham in some way as the father, if you will, of the faith. So uh, the, the thing that becomes particular for well, let me say a little bit more about this definition. 2,000 year history from Abraham uh, to the end of the New Testament. And a good round date for Abraham would be about 1800. That would be about the time of his migration and settling into uh, the promised land, as we sometimes call it, uh, the land of, of Canaan. Uh, and then you run to the end of the New Testament period, uh, John, 
and the Revelation about a hundred, so almost uh, two thousand years, of, uh, almost uh, two thousand years of history there that's covered by the Bible. The the written part of this would only cover about a thousand years. So anything that happens uh, before about uh, 950 uh, BCE would be attributed to the oral tradition. And if you, you can think of it this way, a good round date for King David would be about a thousand. And so the whole period of that time from Abraham to David was a time of restlessness, of lots of moving about, of lots of battles, of lots of warfare, of living here, of living there, of being in Egypt for a while and sojourning and coming back and finally getting back into the land. So it didn't lend itself to historians. So it's after David kind of uh, unifies the country that the historians can begin to evolve and take the oral tradition of the stories that have been passed down about uh, uh, Abraham and all those who followed him and begin to write some of that down. Uh, and they draw from lots of sources to do that. So, so the history itself is a 2,000 year history from Abraham to Revelation, but the written part of it is about a 1,000 year history from uh, the earliest part of the Torah writings in the 900s to the end of the New Testament era. So uh, the Bible is a written account of the Judeo-Christian faith Communities, 2,000 year experience with God and with people inside and outside the faith community. <clears throat> so uh, I think those, that part of the definition is interesting too in that the Hebrew people had to learn how to be a people, had to learn how to live in relationship to each other. And so you get all these laws that they lived by as a part of the Old Testament covenant. But they also had to learn to live in relationship that people, with people who were not like them. It is still the challenge we face today. Living with people who are more or less like us, one way or another, family circle, draw that out a little bit other uh, beyond that to those that uh, might be of same religion or same uh, ethnicity or same political beliefs or whatever you want to say. Uh, and then the further out you draw those circles, you begin to get to those who are not like you in various kinds of ways. And life and religion is about learning how to live, <laughs> and both are hard at times, <laughs> with those who are like you, that is inside the faith community, and also those who are outside the faith community. And that's kind of what we're all about and trying to learn how to make this world we live in a little better place for, for all of us. So uh, experience with God in the process and also with people inside and outside uh, the faith community. Uh, so um, the, uh, the, the curious thing that evolves, let's see, yeah, I'll get to that one in a minute. The curious thing that evolves, of course, is this understanding by Abraham about the gift of the land. Uh, and the, the understanding becomes, uh, from the 12th chapter of uh, uh, Genesis and in various places afterwards, that uh, the land that they would uh, inhabit and that the uh, descendants would also continue to live in was a gifted land that it was their land to live in. It was the promised land. And that begins the whole saga of how to understand in relationship to God the land they were given and what that meant for other peoples, <laughs> those who were already there and those that they would encounter in other ways as time went by. Now, we still... Uh, are trying to deal with that question today in Israel. It, it is still an ongoing question. The place of the Palestinian people, uh, the place of uh, uh, the Muslim faith, place of the Christian faith within uh, Israel itself now. So it's an ongoing saga that's continued to play out. Uh, Walter Brueggemann, whose book I'll show you, and it's, I've got a slide of it in just a moment, um, understands that the key motif of the 
Old Testament is land. That is the promised land, land acquired, and land lost. And how do we understand faith in relationship to those givens? And that's part of what provides for us the dominant theology, if you will, and the countercurrent to the theology. The dominant theology is that the land is yours, and the way you keep the land is to live in relationship to the covenant, uh, the law, the Torah, and you do everything that the law says you should do, and uh, you will therefore keep the land, and you will prosper, and you will win battles, and everything uh, along those lines will happen as it should happen for you. Now, I put this, uh, I put this uh, screen up to show you the, the way the Old Testament canon is uh, aligned according to the Jewish Bible. It's a little different from our Christian. It's the same books, but they're arranged in a different order. And so when you think about the uh, canon, the Jewish Bible, you would think in terms of three different segments of that. Some of this you will certainly know, law and prophets and writings. So uh, the law is the first five books in the Bible, and that, that's, those, uh, that's where all of these things that are part of the covenant begin to develop that uh, you are to live in relationship to in order to keep the land. Then uh, the prophets are those uh, characters that come along to try to reflect upon what went wrong. <laughs> Why did we lose the land? Why did we lose the battles? And how do we understand how to go forward from here? The writings then, the third part of that, uh, which are all listed here, uh, are some of the books that begin, actually it begins in the prophets also, but begin that dialogic countercurrent to the dominant theme that is there and provide you with a way to understand things a little bit differently. So uh, that's... Uh, I wanted to uh, share that with you. Let's see if this will work. There we go. Uh, here's, if you want a book that uh, I think is, is uh, just, a, if you're interested at all in any of this, uh, the history of the Old Testament, uh, of how it came to be, of the theology that becomes a part of it, this is the one book that I would recommend. It's called An Introduction to the Old Testament, the Canon and Christian Imagination, and Walter Brueggemann, and Todd Lenefelt are the authors, mostly Brueggemann. But uh, I'll just leave that up there a while. You can take a picture if you're interested. If you just had one book that would follow up on some of these themes, uh, that would be the one that uh, I would recommend. And that's where some of this lecture is based on today. So here we go. If, if we're going to think about what the countercurrents are, we have to know what the major theological uh, affirmation is. And this, this statement in the uh, book of Deuteronomy, as much as anything else, captures that dominant theology in the Old Testament. Now, uh, set the stage for you a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, those books carry us from Abraham during that, all that complicated process of the living in, in uh, Canaan and sojourning as slaves in Egypt, Moses taking them out of slavery and that wilderness wanderings, that finally they come back into the promised land. And the end of Deuteronomy purports to be sermons from Moses to the people just as they are to enter back into the, the land of the land that was the gift that they've lost once and hope not to lose again, although they will. And so uh, this is a part of that mosaic sermon as completed hundreds of years after the fact, as they rewrite the history as it has developed through time. But this captures as well as anything else the theological belief of what they were doing. It's from the end of Deuteronomy and, and uh, you know Moses is on the plains of Moab. Uh, anybody ever been to Moab, Utah? Uh, 
it, uh, it is, uh, I, they took that name from the Bible because it is, is about a desolate a place as you could ever hope to go to. And so the plains of Moab are like that. Moses stands on the plains of Moab and uh, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to my fair and promised land where my possessions lie, something like that the old hymn says. And he looks across the Jordan to the promised land that he knows he will not enter. But in the words of the historian that writes it down, this is what he says. This is what the dominant theology becomes. So I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking his, in His ways, and observing His commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But... If your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants May live, loving, uh, may live loving the Lord your God, obeying Him and holding fast to Him, for that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, that, that's kind of the summary of the theology. This is your land. It was promised to be given to you, to your uh, uh, the ancestors before you. Uh, you You've had a rugged path to this point, but you're about to enter the land again. And the key to keeping the land is to keep the covenant, to live in relationship to the law. And the more closely you keep it, the more likely you are to be able to prosper in the land and subdue your enemies and live in prosperity within that land. And that becomes the dominant theme then. Uh, how well do we live in relationship to, uh, to the law? Um, now, uh, it, what challenges that is uh, they were unable to keep the land. If the, if the dominant theology is about the gift, the promise and gift of land. You remember from the very beginning, it was, uh, it was uh, a difficult process Remember the old spiritual, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho? Anybody, anybody ever sing that? Some of you have. Uh, the leader after Moses it becomes Joshua. And Joshua is the one that does lead the Hebrew people across the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. And uh, unfortunately, there were people already there who didn't get the memo that this uh, land belonged to the Hebrew people. And so for the next 200 years, a good round date for Moses would be like around 1,200, and a good round date from David is about 1,000. So that 200-year period between when uh, Joshua takes the people across the Jordan River into Canaan is battle after battle after battle. Uh, and, it, and it's during this time that they reaffirm their commitment to the covenant, to keep the covenant and therefore to win the battles and to prosper. And the theology is that if you lose, it's because you haven't kept the covenant strongly enough. And so then you'll have uh, a reaffirmation of, uh, of the covenant and living life in relationship to that. Now, uh, the next section that we're going to deal with uh, is called the, uh, the prophets. And interestingly enough, uh, the, 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 uh, the first section is law. It's just five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's where the, the core part of the Torah, the law, the covenant is all kept. The next big section is called the prophets, 
and there are uh, former prophets and latter prophets. And the former prophets uh, might surprise you. Let me see if I can go back one. I don't know how close you looked at that. There you go. Uh, the former prophets includes the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And that is the story of the entering of the land and the taking of the land. And, and the Jews refer to them as the former prophets uh, rather than uh, history books as we might sometimes think of. So uh, takes us through that. And then uh, the, the, head, the, the, the uh, bookend to that passage from Deuteronomy that uh, you're entering the land, keep the covenant, and you'll keep it, is this passage from the end of Kings of the, the former prophets which talks about the loss of the land. And I hope you can hear the, the tragic emotions that are part of this passage. So 2 Kings 25. In the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month of the tenth day of the month, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came with all of his army against Jerusalem and laid siege against it. He burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. All the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem. And Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, carried into exile the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had defected to the king of Babylon, all the rest of the population. But the king of the guard left some of the poorest people of the land uh, to be wine dressers and tillers of the soil. Now, uh, that refers to an event that happened in, uh, we can date it exactly through this and other sources and people that uh, can do this kind of thing, date it to exactly 587 BCE. So from the time that uh, they enter the land, they possess the land, David becomes king, and then it begins to deteriorate after that, and other peoples begin to take the land uh, until the utter destruction of Jerusalem, which happens in 587. And this becomes the primary crisis in the existential life of the people of the, the Hebrew faith. The land, of, the land is a gift. You possess the land by keeping the law. They tried to keep the law. The crisis becomes when you've lost everything you have, why has that happened? And that's when you get the responses to the why from some of the other aspects of, of the, the Bible. Did I make that clear enough? You're kind of following me, the, the, the storyline there. Um, it's, a, it's a tragic event. Uh, you know, David's son Solomon uh, built the great temple in Jerusalem. It was a symbol of triumph over everything. It was a symbol of triumph over the enemies that lived in Canaan. It was a symbol of the... Of the uh, authenticity of the faith that allowed them to have a central place to worship and uh, offer sacrifices and all of those things. It was a grand city, a grand temple. The king had a house there. Uh, it was a central place. Be like our Washington, D.C., except uh, infused with all the religious fervor that they could have in, in uh, their faith. Uh, after Solomon's death, it begins to deteriorate, and all those peoples that they had defeated and others strengthened. And it was more warfare again uh, with the people of Israel, culminating in the Babylonians who finally uh, do what is described here uh, in the text, and that is completely destroy Jerusalem, uh, including the temple, including the king's house, uh, killed as many people as they could, took all the leading citizens off into Babylonian exile, you hear that term, where they lived away from Jerusalem, left a few farmers there to kind of uh, take care of the land. And it becomes then the existential crisis for the faith of uh, the people of uh, Israel at this point. So uh, uh, the counter-narratives then primarily 
are in response to uh, what has happened. And that's what I want. Had to, took a long time to get there, didn't it? But kind of had to set the stuff. I mean, you, can, you know, how, how long does it take to summarize the whole Old Testament? It takes, a, you know, I did it in about 30 minutes. That's not too bad. Probably left a few things out. <laughs> um, so, uh, this section of all those former prophets, uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings, we understand to have been written by uh, either one writer or one uh, school of writers, probably not completely put together until after the exile, so that they are reflecting back on this, or at least during it. And it, some of you have studied parts of this, I know. the contributors to the Old Testament uh, written material, the J-E-D-P, some of you know a little bit about that. Uh, this would be the D writer, the Deuteronomic theologian historian, who probably, scholars think, wrote that whole section of the former prophets. And uh, the theology then is maintained that my, my uh, professor at uh, Old Testament in uh, that Perkins uh, said it this way, an easy way to remember it. The dominant theology was uh, piety pays, perversity punishes. You know, an easy way to remember. You keep the law, you do well, you prosper. You don't keep the law, you, you know, everything goes south on you. So uh, that is uh, what the prophetic tradition and the writings then have to reflect over and against as to why this has happened. So... Uh, uh, it, is a, it is a reflection against a simplistic theology that if you do all the right things, you put the right coins in the vending machine and you pull the lever and you get what you expect to get. And Israel experienced life, as do we all, as a little more complicated than that. <laughs> so that... Uh, the countercurrents to that dominant theology began to be seen uh, in, in other books. So let me get to some of those. Now, here come the countercurrents. Uh, let me see where I am on slides here. What's next? Uh, uh, here's a quote from Brueggemann We may say that the Torah concerns a promise of and eventually entry into the land of promise. The former prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, tell the narrative of land loss once the Jordan River has been crossed. These four books constitute a tale of land lost that is commensurate with the Torah narrative of land gift. The dual themes of land gift and land loss constitute a single primary narrative. So that's what Brueggemann says about the, what we're dealing with uh, in the Old Testament books. And you could, it is existential for them. If your whole understanding is that you are a chosen people and the basis of that is a land given to you, all you have to do is keep the covenant and you'll keep it, and then it all falls apart it, it, and you lose the land, you have in a sense lost part of your reason for being. So it is... Uh, uh, a uh, existential crisis which requires a little dip, uh, bit of digging deeper into the understanding of the faith, which is our story too, isn't it? You know, things are going well and you just coast along, but if crisis comes, you have to decide what you really believe and what you really count on uh, as a part of your faith. So here's another quote from Brueggemann. This is a good one. Every community of meaning read religion, every community of meaning tries either to assimilate what it sees as the other or failing that to eliminate the other. And so this whole process then of uh, the faith community moving into the land, the question becomes uh, how exclusive will we be? Is it just us? and others uh, are not part of the picture in any way, or can we find a way to assimilate 
them into our structure and belief system. And look, that's the story of religion today, isn't it? it? How do you live with those who are not exactly like you are? How tightly do you draw the circle? Or how broad do you allow it to become without losing your identity, but being gracious in the process? So I said I want to talk about the United Methodist Church, but that's exactly where we are today. How tightly do you draw the circle uh, so that it, you keep the purity, you know? You keep the faith pure and everything will work out well. And then if you deviate from that and begin to assimilate and draw that circle a little bit wider, then you have to learn how to live with those who are different from you. Here's what Martin Marty says. Uh, Martin Marty spoke in this very place one time uh, as a uh, lecturer that we co-sponsored at the church with the... Uh, Foundation for Contemporary Theology. He was he's still alive. He's in his 90s now. Uh, professor Emeritus now of, uh, at, the, uh, at the University of Chicago. I'm supposed to stay here, aren't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> People at home are seeing a blank screen back there. They should be here, shouldn't they? Yeah. Anyway, Bill would say that. Um, professor Emeritus of the uh, uh, Sociology of Religion and Culture. And this is what he says. Simple little statement. The problem with religion is the civil are not committed and the committed are not civil. <laughs> now you can remember that. And, and as good as anything I've ever run across, that defines the dilemma in our religious life. You know, you find those people that are really committed and they're just mean people sometimes. <laughs> or they want to exclude everybody that's not exactly like them so that we have, you know, thousands of denominations now within Christianity. Uh, not quite pure enough so we'll break off and become purer. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you let it slide too far, there are some foul balls, I like to say. You know, you have to have boundaries in a baseball game. And something is fair and something is foul. And so those who are civil, kind of like me, you know, I think I am at times at least, broad-minded, uh, open-minded, if you get too much like that, you let something of the heart of who you are, of your identity slip away. So the challenge is to become both committed and civil at the same time. Martin Marty says it's the problem in religion. It's a hard thing to do. So you have these books then that begin to develop. And the first one I want to look at is, is uh, I'll be quick here. Yeah, I'll stay here. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, is the book of Job. Now, uh, my, one of my Old Testament professors at, in seminary said, uh, you shouldn't preach from the book of Job until, until you've been in the ministry for 40 years. <laughs> so it's a very deep book. Uh, but think of it in the context of what we've been talking about. And the beginning of the book of Job says this. Now consider my servant Job, who was perfect and upright in every way. So that's what uh, is set out at the beginning. And then if you know anything about the book of Job, he has all these things. Terrible things happen to him. Uh, uh, conflict between the God character and the Satan, the adversary character. But it, it, is a, it is a reflection on why do bad things happen to good people or when bad things happen to good people. How do you understand it? And so Job is a countercurrent to that if you keep the faith, it'll all be okay. And it is one of the prime examples. So he has all of these terrible things. Loses his family, you know, sitting on the dung heap, scraping his boils with pot shirts. It's a, it's a terrible experience for Job when it's set up in the beginning. Perfect and upright in every way. No servant is like him anyway, anywhere. So uh, one of the countercurrents in the uh, Old Testament canon is the book of Job. Uh, when things don't play out according to the script. Another one is uh, uh, the book of Ruth. If you think about it, uh, let me just uh, remind you that when the, uh, the Israelites came back from exile, uh, they came back because 
uh, Cyrus the Persian defeated the Babylonians and the Persians didn't want to do have anything to do with all those Jews as subservient people so they sent them back home and uh, that's a counter current in itself to look to Cyrus as a savior who was non-Jewish and Isaiah does that in his own text but uh, so they, they, uh, they come back and uh, Ezra book of Ezra in the Old Testament is so convinced that what went wrong was that they have uh, become too broad. They have assimilated with the other. In the book of uh, Ezra, every foreign wife that every Hebrew person brought back from the exile to uh, Jerusalem, Ezra says, send them home. So he broke up families, sent home children and wives back to their own land so they could reestablish the purity of the race and the purity uh, of the religion. So uh, that was a book that didn't have the counter current, but just, just to keep that in mind, then the book of Ruth, remember, uh, Ruth uh, goes uh, with her, uh, uh, Naomi goes with her husband, from Israel to uh, Moab, interestingly, and there uh, she has two sons. Her husband dies, and uh, her two sons marry Moabite women. One of them's name is Ruth. Anybody know the name of the other Moabite woman that uh, one of uh, Naomi's sons married? It's interesting. This is a freebie. Who knows? Somebody knows? Orpa. Somebody say Orpah. What's the significance of that? That's right. It's exactly right. It's Oprah's. You were in my other class. That's right. uh, Oprah Winfrey's parents, uh, poor uh, farmers in Mississippi, looked for a Bible name for their daughter and misspelled Oprah. Uh, Orpah to become Oprah. Anyway, that was one of the other daughters uh, who was uh, uh, a Moabite that uh, Naomi's children married. Uh, so uh, when uh, the sons marry, so you've had the father die and the sons die, uh, Naomi says, I'm going to go back to Israel. And it's there that Ruth, who is a Moabite, not a Hebrew, says those famous lines, Whither thou goest, I will go. Your people shall be my people, and I'll go back with you. And interestingly enough, Ruth becomes uh, the, the grandmother of David. So within the royal line, you have a Moabite person who has uh, pledged allegiance to come back uh, with uh, Naomi, her mother-in-law, to live in Israel. So it's another countercurrent going against what Ezra would have done or what the law might have told. And I've got time for one more, I think, and that is, uh, there's several, but uh, let's look quickly at the book of Jonah. Uh, Jonah is a little short story uh, in which uh, he is asked to go prophesy to the Ninevites. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria arch enemy before the Babylonians came along, the arch enemy of Israel defeated much of Israel before the Babylonians came along. And Jonah doesn't want to do it. You know, he goes in the opposite direction, swallowed by the Lord fish and in the story. Uh, finally comes to his senses. He goes a day's walk in a city that is three days across, uh, three, walk, three days to walk across it and has a one sentence sermon in Forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed. And every person in the city repents, and God accepts the Ninevites into uh, becoming His people. And uh, it, it is just an example of, a, of drawing the circle larger. And uh, uh, Jonah's the only book in the Bible that ends with a question. And it ends with, uh, are you generous even to those who are not your own? Something like that. And the countercurrent to that, the answer is, yes, God is. So uh, <clears throat> just a, a way to uh, uh, 
present to you the dominant theology of the Old Testament, which is if you do everything right, everything will work out. But, and, and that includes lots of uh, exclusionary statements and being committed to uh, uh, a very narrow way of looking at things. Life didn't always turn out like that. And the countercurrents within the canon itself allow you to be a more uh, gracious, uh, broad person. So uh, I, uh, one last story, and then I shall quit. Uh, I'll stay here, too. The, uh, uh, <clears throat> I used to do, when I was on the north side of town as a pastor, I did a lot of funerals with Teddy Klein, who owned Klein, uh, Klein Funeral Home, and uh, w was, uh, would ride back and forth with him to the cemetery, and he'd tell me stories about the old days. And he said in the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church there in Klein that they were really strict. And if you were a member of the Masonic Lodge, uh, you could not be buried in the Lutheran Cemetery. And they had a very prominent citizen in town that had kind of been a part of the Masonic Lodge. He died, and the rule was he couldn't be buried in the cemetery, but he was very prominent, gave lots of money. Church was in, the family very involved in the church. And I, I said, well, you know, what'd they do, Teddy? And he said, well, they, true story, they allowed him to be buried outside the fence. So he was buried outside the fence. And I said, well, I guess that's one way to do it. And he was quiet for a while. And then he said, you know, as time went by, <laughs> they had to extend, expand the cemetery. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I want to make a plea for expanding the cemetery, <laughs> for drawing those circles wider, uh, to affirm a belief in a more gracious and inclusive God and uh, that it helps us understand the complexities of life and live in relationship to the other, not by eliminating them, but by learning to live with them. Our religion, our church, our world, our faith would be better, I think, though it's tricky if we could all do that. God bless you. <laughs>